Let's talk. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Dear Hollywood, The Hunger Games, Rehab and Plastic Surgery. Okay, you ready to go in? We're going all the way in. So all of this, food and perfectionism and Hollywood pressures, uh, boiled to a head in the audition for The Hunger Games. I was trying my best to tame my eating disorder, but when I received an audition for Katniss and I knew from the books that she was essentially emaciated, I felt compelled to match the description as best as possible. For the record, I'm glad that they hired someone who at least had some meat on her bones so young people weren't glorifying starvation, but I still gave my all and I thought, you know, maybe the reason I hadn't had my breakthrough moment was because I was playing it safe. I wasn't taking extraordinary enough measures to stand out. So I dyed my hair black. I got ripped by these rigorous workouts, flipping tires and swinging sledgehammers. I spent two weeks at the same place Biggest Loser contestants go, getting my body fat percentage the lowest it's ever been. Um, I clearly did not get the job. Nor did I even make the short list. I've heard tons of talented actors were on it, like Abigail Breslin, Zoe Dutch, Chloe Grace Moritz, Shirsa Ronan, uh, Haley Steinfeld, Shailene Woodley, Emma Roberts, all the others. Instead, I hit my rock bottom. I was not breaking through. I was not the chosen one in my generation. I was not the right look or talent or client or something. I was a wafer thin, soon to be washed up has been. I was falling more and more behind my peers. They made it. I didn't. And at that moment, I knew I needed help and that I couldn't go on. So I admitted myself to rehab, even though my managers discouraged me to do so. You see, you don't want to lose career momentum or, you know, you really might seal the coffin on your career. So the idea is just don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Was choosing to get help a self-fulfilling prophecy of quote-unquote failing to make it big? Maybe from one angle, but was getting help also the moment that gave me the strength and tools to change the course of my life, health, relationships, and career? 100%. So I went to rehab. And yes, it was awkward and uncomfortable and frightening and also stabilizing and relieving and empowering. When I first arrived, I saw DVDs of movies I was in lining the shelves in the living area. And you know, these other kids needed an outlet sometimes, but the movies that were their outlet were my trigger. And this might have been the first time I self-advocated in this way. Um, and I remember feeling so nervous that I was rude for requesting this because remember I conditioned to let everyone have access to me at any time but I walked over to a staff member and I you know privately asked if the movies could be removed from the shelves they were immediately responsive and understanding so thank you if any of you happen to see this but the following day I received a message from my managers <laughs> mind you I wasn't supposed to even be able to receive messages from the outside world, but famous people get, you know, distorted access and special treatment, right? And um, and guess what? My team said, you know, hey, you didn't get the part of Katniss, but they want you to read for Clove. And, you know, given I was never taught how to say no, I felt obligated, even on bed rest, to make it happen. And of course, you know, because of the twisted cultural enchantment with fame, I explained the situation to the behavioral therapist and they made an exception for me to self-tape the audition. Like, what the fuck? But when I stepped away from group therapy and I was alone in a room rehearsing lines, I just, I couldn't do it. I was here to heal. You know, I couldn't bring Hollywood here. I couldn't enact my privilege this way. This was supposed to be a safe place with healthy boundaries so that I could heal. So I didn't do it. Um, I decided I would truly just commit to the program, no exceptions, no special treatment. Yes, um, many of the other kids in there still recognized me throughout the journey, but you know, that was just something I was going to have to deal with if I wanted to heal. Um, I was there for months under strict rules 
including not being able to stand for too long because they knew it was a tactic to try and burn more calories than sitting. Every day, you know, solo and group sessions, weekly equine therapy, which changed my life. And then family week, where we finally saw our loved ones for the first time to, you know, catch them up on our progress. And then I transitioned to a halfway house of sorts. Um, So I was in a home setting and I could like practice the skills I'd need to use when I was back with my family. Um, Skills for managing urges and triggers, uh, skills for, you know, making appropriately portioned meals. And I remember clinging to mantras like food is neither friend nor foe, food is just fuel, as well as one day, one hour, one moment at a time. And um, now is not forever. I had uncovered some of the deeper motives behind my eating disorder. Um, I had learned how to communicate my needs and ask for help. And on top of the ED-related recovery, I started to unpack whether I truly wanted to be in entertainment or, you know, if I was just afraid to fail and, and find out I had no other options. The first months home were brutal and scary, but uh, I had to face it eventually. After years of stuffing down horrible anxiety, after dissociating for large parts of a decade, um, and now trying to reconnect with my body safely, it was really intense. Many of the kids ended up right back in rehab again. Um, Many of my peers did not remain sober, they did not have the support system, and they were just enabled to revert back to our vices. While it scared me to be away from Hollywood this long, um, I chose not to audition right away, just in case it was too big of a trigger. Uh, You know, I'd also gained 15 to 20 pounds, and it was healthy, but in Hollywood, I didn't know how that was going to be received. I was still very vulnerable. But I also felt like it would be important at some point to face my fear of the industry head on. So after a few months, an audition came in for an ABC pilot. Kirstie Alley played the mom, rest in peace, um, Rhea Perlman, the grandmother, legend, and I would go out for the lead daughter, which I felt so lucky. Like after being away, I still had a chance at a huge job like this. It was nerve wracking, but I did it. And guess what? First audition back, I fucking booked it. Are you kidding me? Like my first series regular role as an adult on a major network with a star-studded cast. And you know what it felt like to get one of the biggest jobs of my life? Terrifying. Instead of being elated that I finally might become, you know, a well-known actor to wider audiences, literally my dream that I had been working on since six, I felt dread. I was conflicted beyond imagination. I had deconstructed so much in treatment and, you know, I started daring to believe I may actually want to willingly step away from all of this. And I'd finally met adults who looked at me as a whole human, not a product, and told me I had worth beyond commodifying my body and talent. Besides, I felt super unready to go from zero to 100 again. You know, I watched Demi and Selena and others do that and it didn't go well. But guess what? I had signed the contract because when you test for TV pilots at the final audition, even before you book the job, you have to sign terms that may dictate the next several years of your life. So I filmed the show. It was frankly not an enjoyable experience. It's almost odd. Even as I share some, you know, shitty parts of previous jobs, I pretty much always found them to be Net positive, you know, worthwhile, inspiring, but this, it just felt off. Thankfully, and I never thought that I'd say this, the show didn't get picked up. And in case you missed me sharing this in other places, I have one of the unluckiest streaks when it comes to TV pilots. I can't remember if it's seven or 11 shows, but I've literally booked roles to be series regulars on major networks, including having my own show. And, you know, they have star-studded casts and they're like slated to be hits and zero of them have been greenlit. Um, So in this moment, I was so grateful that my unlucky streak persisted. The phenomenological complexity of this experience really lingered with me. In the quiet recesses of my heart, ideas of a different life were begging to be heard. 
but the battle between you know making it in Hollywood and leaping into the great unknown wasn't over. I had a drive to prove that I could succeed in Hollywood on my own terms. You know, I could reclaim my power. I could produce my own content now that social media and digital platforms were taking off. My body would still be a commercial product, but I would be in charge. I would still face criticism for my crooked nose and lazy eye and flat chest and now fuller figure post-treatment. But I could figure out something else with my appearance to be attractive enough. Something, what would that be? Wait, no. I couldn't do that. No, that was against my values. This this is dangerous. I, But actually, it's something I really want to do. There's something I've left out of the story so far. And in order to communicate my inner wrestling match and how it translated to outer decisions, I have to tell you something. But let me give you a little bit more of the backstory first. So among the cadre of side effects from my eating disorder, one of the biggest drawbacks was a weakened immune system. Every month I had another sinus infection and I was always congested whenever I had to sing on stage. Now some of this was psychosomatic for sure, but it couldn't seem to make it better. So I visited an ENT at 14 and he said my septum was deviated 90% and that the day I turned 16, I needed surgery. That was a little scary to hear, but also I wanted to improve my vocal performance. My body was my product. The rest of the story is, if I'm being honest, I secretly wondered if this legitimate medical issue could be an excuse to alter my appearance. As I mentioned, by then I was experiencing fame and receiving lots of criticism, namely for my nose, flat chest, and lazy eye. People posted side-by-sides of my face with strange-looking animals. They started forums on IMDb tearing down my appearance and acting skills. They ranked attractive young starlets, and I never made the list, but the unattractive starlets? I was right there. And with my career path, the message I was perceiving from inside Hollywood was that I was decent looking enough to play the best friend, but not pretty enough to play a lead or beautiful character. Leading ladies had straight, petite noses, perfect teeth, sweet, plump lips, narrow shoulders, a sharp clavicle, and a full B slash small C cup. Exactly. Well, I had a large, crooked nose, razor-thin lips, jaw issues, an athletic build, and no boobs. I truly felt ugly, but I tried to ignore or reframe those thoughts with positive affirmations, scriptures, and I also tried not to speak about this out loud because I was a role model and I sincerely didn't want to be a hypocrite. Well, this cover-up worked decently, uh, even to deceive myself. At the same time I was starving, I was trying to embody and project inspiration, well-being, light, love. At the same time that I felt invisible next to my hot blonde peers, I resolved to find my own pathway to being interesting, lovable, and worthy. Because if it wasn't my looks, then I'd cultivate intelligence, wit, kindness. Can we say toxic positivity? Well, secretly, as you now know, I was struggling and so conflicted. And on some nights, I could not resist searching plastic surgery before and after photos and just wishing I could change myself. I downloaded apps. I played around with subtle enhancements, you know, the kind that no one would even notice. They'd think I was naturally this beautiful and I just grew into my features. What was weird was this inner longing conflated two parts of me. The little girl who just wanted to be beautiful for once, and also the ruthless workhorse who was willing to tweak and optimize myself as a product in whatever way it took to become the Oscar-winning leading lady I thought I was capable of being. Well, here I was, post-rehab, out of the public eye a bit, one foot in entertainment, one foot out, confused, trying to find myself, trying to love myself, and around 18, I think... I got serious about the medical procedure for my septum. Of course, my mom reassured me that I didn't need any aesthetic changes, but I knew I wasn't going to voluntarily go under the knife twice. So if I was going to fix my septum, I was also going to give myself a chance to correct the flaws I felt were holding me back from feeling confident and from being a lead actor. There was so much shame in this. I kept hearing thoughts like, God doesn't make mistakes, and you're losing yourself to Hollywood. You're trying to become the very representation of beauty that burdened you for a decade. And yet, 
in my odd privileged position, going under the knife wasn't that uncommon. It was almost expected. Many of my peers had already begun dabbling with fillers and implants. Some of their music contracts seemed like plastic surgery was written into the code. Was I just like them? Was I shallow for wanting to feel what it was like to be a pretty girl? Would I have ever considered this if I wasn't a product of Hollywood, if I didn't live 30 minutes from Beverly Hills? I texted my friend, who is like a sister, and she knew my decade-long battle. And when I said, you know what, I'm finally doing it, she ultimately understood. She continued to support me doing the mental and emotional work to love myself, but she also understood why this physical change meant something. So I went into the office for my consultation. I brought the photos I had altered on the plastic surgery app. And the surgeon, who I learned was also a father and kind human, said, First, you are a beautiful young lady and you do not need to change anything. Second, the most important priority is your health and correcting your septum. Third, I understand you'd like to make some cosmetic adjustments simultaneously, and these photos are actually quite reasonable. Simply straightening the nose and narrowing the bridge, I might also remove the hanging columella. While I'm willing to honor your wish, I still want you to look like yourself. If you're looking for a surgeon who's going to give you a nose out of a catalog, I'm not the right fit. I still want you to retain your authentic essence and your general shape, even if it's not considered cookie-cutter perfect. Now, I will say in a town of extreme characters, I felt relieved and I felt like he was level-headed. If you recall, I didn't grow up around my dad. He was in Ohio while I was working in LA. And so I found these moments with grown male humans to be oddly reassuring, even somewhat protective and validating. Well, the surgery was smooth and the recovery was intense. I mean, Good thing I had learned to manage anxiety through something other than exercise because I could not move or eat solid food for what seemed like forever. And the doctor told me to be extra patient. It was going to be 12 months before I started seeing the final shape, and it actually took more like two years. And yes, I had to be on camera before the swelling went down, and it was so embarrassing to look like a dinosaur. But finally, a year and a half later, I saw myself in the mirror, and I felt beautiful. I felt empowered. Yes, a little sheepish about the shallowness of my decision, but also those insecurities from childhood, they actually dissipated. No, I certainly didn't correct every asymmetry and I certainly still have lots of quirks in my appearance, but I finally felt attractive inside and out. And you know what? Whether it was aesthetic or energetic, others noticed. In the industry, as I predicted, I started booking new kinds of roles lead roles, roles that were viewed as attractive. So am I glad I went forward with it? Yeah. Do I also still find it internally complex? Yes. Do I sometimes feel like a coward who couldn't feel beautiful without succumbing? Sometimes yes. But do I judge others for making similar decisions? Not at all. This was just part of my human journey. And I respect everyone's journey with their own bodies, their own motives, preferences, transformations. It changed my experience of myself for the better, and it almost freed me to stop giving so much energy to the insecurity and just go out and enjoy life more easily. So the combination of a weakened immune system, the deep insecurities, global criticism, and viewing my body as a product created the perfect storm for this decision. Listen, I know the surgery is not like that hidden. There are clearly noticeable changes and it's very vulnerable to discuss, but it's something I've never addressed in this way because I was afraid of how much judgment would follow. And then there's the continued scrutiny of picking apart the results of the surgery and what I should have done differently. So I hope I have the self-control to just not read or internalize the comments that follow this. Your words really do have a tangible impact. So body image media pressures, commodifying a child's body as a product, public scrutiny. How is this all landing for you now? When you hear that a kid star turns to substances, develops eating disorders, alters their appearance, does it still land the exact same way as before? If not, what's different? And when you speak haphazardly about celebrities commenting on their posts about their appearance or striving to emulate them or tearing them down for falling short of perfection, how does it feel to know that you might be a part of the reason they made a life-altering decision? 
that you actually do have some kind of power and sway, even if that seems impossible. How does your perception of me change? What are you going to do with this information? Rush to send a juicy text to your friend and say, I knew it. I knew Allison did it. I hope not. I hope you'll respect the sacredness of my transparency and we can sit shoulder to shoulder, gazing out at this wide world, exploring how to navigate it, how to do our best, how to support each other. Now, as I mentioned, every person's journey in this is different, and I need to acknowledge that many of my peers have had it so much harder than I did. They were global celebrities facing exponentially more pressure and hate. They were disgustingly sexualized and sometimes subjected to many forms of violence because they did grow boobs and fill out during puberty. Their bodies are truly a product of objectification and consumption, our entertainment. And they, and you, and I may be adults now with hopefully more bodily autonomy, but I still wonder what younger parts of us are inside. I still wonder how our early programming influences the course of our lives today. Hopefully after today, I've continued demystifying another fragment in the Toddler to Trainwreck pipeline. There are still so many stories to spill and so much more to cover. And in fact, next I want to go so, so, so deep to look at what's happening in our nervous systems. And this territory really hasn't been explored in this way before, so I'll see you there. On the next episode... And by the time I was a teenager and under so much stress without these tools, my survival response was just to dissociate and disconnect altogether. So I want to share a little bit about my experience. You can get to know my nervous system.